Hey, what's up everyone? This video took a long time to edit, so it's coming out a little bit later than I wanted it to. But anyways, I hope you enjoy it and it has a lot of information. If you're like me, you wanna really learn about the battery manufacturing process and also Tesla's position and advantage within the industry versus the other competitors. So for the first test, we're going to be um, plugging in a can of soda. Whoa! A couple of other things to mention. One is at the very end, we discuss the end game for Elon, which I think will be really interesting. He really does want to die on Mars. And also, I want to get right into the video because it's so long. But one other thing to consider, and I've mentioned this before, is just to make sure that your expectations are reasonable heading into this event. You know, we talked in the past about Autonomy Day and how that wasn't necessarily a positive catalyst for the stock. Take a look at this short clip from a video that I'll leave the link to in the description, but you can see how different markets participants can interpret events very differently depending on what they choose to take away from that event. What really spooked me was um, the autonomous day and, and nothing about the day itself but what really spooked me was when Elon said that you know all of the future free cash flow of this company is going to come from you know basically like a, a rideshare fleet. Anyway thanks again for watching. Let's take a look and get right into it, and I appreciate it. The person that I'm interviewing has real expertise in investing in the metals and mining sector, and so they've looked at things slightly differently from the traditional Tesla investor, but they really had a lot of insight about the electric vehicle market, batteries, the different components that go into the manufacturing of batteries. And we first started off with just tell us about, teach us about what goes into a battery. How is it constructed? How is an electric vehicle battery different from a regular battery? And we get right into it. So here it is. So any battery, whether it's a bunch of pieces of lead sitting, like if you've seen that episode in Breaking Bad, um, spoiler alert, where they try to charge up the Winnebago, um, when Jesse accidentally leaves the keys in. Walt's genius uses a bunch of old metal and you know puts it in a pile and creates a battery out of thin air. This doesn't look like any battery I ever saw. Trust me, it is a battery. But the same principle applies, which is that you have a cathode with a negative charge, a separator. Uh, in this case, you know, Walter White used a sponge, but um, there are more sophisticated technologies and formats for Tesla. And then you have the anode, which is the positive charge. And the electrons move from the negatively charged cathode through the separator to the anode. That's how you get a charge. So whether it's an old lead battery that you use to power your electric razor or you know, a sophisticated cathode separator anode technology in an EV, it's the same basic principle. So that can't change. What you can change is the elements that make up those constituent parts. So you can use a little more nickel, a little less cobalt, or you use, for example, the Model 3 in China, which just announced it'll use the LFP batteries more on iron and phosphate. That's going to be, you know, the levers that you pull to change the mix a little bit. But it, really, the constituent parts of the battery haven't really changed over time. It's very important to keep in mind that this is not the type of issue that OEMs have had to think about, right? Typically, you know, the supply chain, it's sort of long-standing relationships, but in terms of where is the energy that powers the vehicle, where is that going to come from? It was always just kind of a fungible resource and, you know, sometimes oversupply, sometimes undersupply. But that was not the responsibility of auto OEMs, right? The equivalent for oil for electric vehicle would be the metals that go into the battery. So this is a very new problem, frankly, for the industry. And I think when you think about Tesla, one of the reasons that they have been ahead of the curve, it's not just the fact that their battery costs have come down quicker than competition, the average you know, cost per kilowatt hour for most auto OEMs right now for their EV vehicles is roughly $150 per kilowatt hour, and Tesla's well below that. And they really should get a lot of credit for driving those costs down. I kind of compare them to Apple in that, you know, what is it that they've been able to do? It's really the, the owning of the whole supply chain. So with Apple, it's really the hardware, the software, you know, owning it from top to bottom rather than sort of relying on third-party vendors for software similar to Tesla in that the software, the hardware, and then thinking about even the metals down in the supply chain that eventually get into the battery cathode, that get into the battery, that are then put into a Tesla vehicle, they're thinking about that from end to end. So, you know, this is a very capital intensive way to look at a new industry. And obviously, there's a lot of risk involved. 
to them to put forth all that effort if they weren't going to be the market leader. But now that's given them a very, very long-term cost advantage and, frankly, what should end up being a performance advantage, too, that they just control this from end to end and have thought about their supply chain from end to end in a way that a lot of other automakers haven't. So you asked specifically about what goes into a battery. Well, just like any other battery that you would have, you know, typically uh, we would think of lead acid batteries. That's the uh, historical, you know, Duracell Energizer. Actually, in terms of electric vehicles, those have been the standard format. For China specifically, it's, you know, lead iron phosphate. Um, those have really driven uh, EV sales to date, in part because, you know, those batteries, they don't give you a lot of range. But China's use so far for EVs hasn't required a lot of range. They haven't required a lot of energy density. So when you think about the buses in China that are just doing, you know, a metro round trip and then charging overnight in a garage and doing the same thing the next day, you can do that and not worry about a longer range battery. But I think what the industry is now realizing is that in order to drive consumer adoption, one of the things that they really care about consumers is energy density in their battery, which allows them to drive with more power and drive further per charge. And particularly in the United States or Australia or Brazil, places where, you know, the average commute is a little bit longer and people like taking road trips, having a battery that, you know, craps out at 100 miles is not typically ideal, especially right now when you don't have a big network of superchargers and you're waiting for an hour to charge up your battery. So in order to get that higher energy density and in order to extend range, and this frankly has been a focus of Tesla as well as a lot of their other competitors, um, the newer next generation battery formats have been coming out. Um, right now in the industry, it is a variant of nickel manganese cobalt, or Tesla uses something that is nickel cobalt aluminum. Uh, the upshot here is that these batteries, NMC, nickel manganese cobalt, and NCA, nickel cobalt aluminum, they're all very dependent on nickel, um, and they're named for the battery cathode. So you can play around with the mix between nickel and cobalt and manganese, or nickel and cobalt and aluminum, depending on what you want in terms of safety features, maximizing range, you can tweak it here and there. The more nickel you use, the longer the range will be but you do need a little bit of cobalt still to prevent it from catching on fire. Cobalt's really in there to cool the battery cathode. So that's a snapshot of the cathode. The other elements of the battery to keep in mind, we all think of these as lithium ion batteries. And all the batteries I just mentioned right now, the nickel manganese cobalt NMC and nickel cobalt aluminum and NCA, those are all variants of lithium ion batteries. They're named that way because lithium is really you know, the electrolyte, it's sort of the, the separator through which electrons go from the cathode, the negative energy source, to the anode. And the anode part of the battery, it's, you know, the less sexy end of it, and nobody really focuses on that, but that contains a lot of graphite. And right now there is a, you know, switch going on between natural graphite, which is in tight demand, and some synthetic types of graphite too. But really, the way to think about it is you have the lithium, and then you have the cathode, which is where all of these base metals come in. And that's really where the action is in terms of, you know, where the scarcity is going to be coming from. And then you have graphite in the anode. Nickel in a Tesla current battery would be over 80% by weight of the battery. So that's a very high percentage of the overall weight of the vehicle. There are three reasons that you would prefer nickel. The first being economic. Nickel per pound is quite a bit cheaper than cobalt. Second is the technology in that nickel, and, and I don't even say technology, it's chemistry, it's basic chemistry. Energy density is a inherent innate function of these chemical elements, right? So you can't change the energy density of nickel nor cobalt. That's just what they are, similar to boiling point. Or atomic weight. They're just they're, they're aspects of the element. Nickel has a higher energy density than cobalt. So by maximizing the nickel per pound in the cathode, you are extending the range of the vehicle. So it's cheaper, it works better, lasts longer, and now you have the third reason, which is it doesn't have the same sort of environmental hang-ups that you might have with cobalt coming from Central Africa. The first question, are they scarce? Yes. Okay. Yes, they are. 
Um, and even though everybody's trying to minimize the amount of cobalt, not just Tesla, um, it is very likely if you have any reasonable assumption for EV sales penetration by the middle of this decade, by 2023 or 24, I think the battery packs will have come down enough in price such that they will reach cost parity with the internal combustion engines. And that's really sort of in, in when you look at a technology S curve, that's the point at which I think adoption because at that point, why wouldn't you buy an EV, right? To the extent you have enough charging stations and the range is there and the cost is lower, you know, that's really where you start taking off. But even if you get to, let's say, 10% sales penetration by 2025, which is kind of in line with some sell side estimates, I think it's a bit conservative, that yeah. scenario would be uh, taking roughly 600,000 tons of nickel on a market that's currently 2.4, 2.4 million tons. So 600,000 on 2.4 over a quarter of the current market would be devoted to this you know, new source of demand and growing from there. Currently, the nickel market is roughly two-thirds stainless steel, stainless steel in terms of you know, where the supply goes, um, which is why if you look at the nickel price, it's trading you know, below $6 a pound, um, which is around the marginal cost of production. Metals typically don't trade around the marginal cost of production if you're going to see such a huge demand spike. So I do think looking at the nickel market and looking at nickel miners makes a lot of sense. I don't think battery metal scarcity is going to necessarily be enough to stall the EV adoption rates. If you think about nickel right now, if prices doubled from $6 a pound to $12 a pound, the impact on your typical electric vehicle would be roughly $1,000. You know, That's battery prices have been declining on average 19% you know, over the last decade per year. Not all of that's driven by Tesla, frankly, um, or at least they kickstarted this revolution. Um, so that extra thousand dollars immediately in your costs, it's not going to be helpful, but it means, all right, maybe battery costs um, slow that decline and maybe they're going down five to 10% in terms of cost per year. But it's less about the inputs in terms of what's been driving battery costs going down. It's really not the commodity inputs, but rather um, economies of scale. And you've Brilliant. seen, you know, these gigafactories in China and in Nevada, like everybody's building these. And once that capacity comes online, you know, nickel prices going up or down 20% is not really going to move the needle. That said, there is going to be a lot of scarcity. So it will behoove all of these automakers to think about their long-term supply of these metals in a way that they never have before. You're already seeing a lot of auto OEMs, Tesla, Audi, VW, think about long-term sourcing agreements with respect to cobalt. So it's not just Tesla. There are other people who are trying to do that. I think the next wave of this, and you're not there yet because the nickel scarcity hasn't quite hit the market just yet, uh, although Indonesia did just surprise the market last year by banning exports of unfinished nickel products. So that kind of scared the market a little bit, and the price rallied 60% in a matter of a couple of months. So it just goes to show, like, commodities tend not to be anticipatory assets, right? right? This isn't like a stock where it's ideally discounting all future information into the price. Rather, this is you know, typically driven by uh, commodity traders uh, or just physical uh, purchasers who are thinking about the next six to nine months. So this is why you've seen for lithium and cobalt, you know, the price will be stable, 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 and then it gets a little bit tight, inventories get low, and then they spike two or three X. So I think a lot of people are starting to think about their long-term nickel uh, supply agreements and their long-term nickel offtake agreements. And I do think there's going to be major scarcity. So one thing to keep in mind with that news, um, so th there are a few points here. Uh, CATL is actually one of the quickest battery makers to get to commercially viable NMC 811 batteries. So 811 means eight times nickel versus one times manganese, one times cobalt. So if you just think of a traditional NMC battery 111, that's an even mix by weight of all of those. Um, the industry has been pushing towards 632 or even 532 batteries. Um, CATL was one of the first to get to sort of very nickel heavy, which is great for, you know, longer distance and higher energy density per charge. Um, the problem is, as you continue to use less and less cobalt, you increase the likelihood of having some kind of fire event. But CATL was actually able to figure it out. So for Tesla, it's a bit of a shock, I think, to the market that then they would say, all right, for our Model 3s produced in China, we're going to go back to an LFP format. Why would you do that? There are a few different reasons. First of all, 
um, you know, for certain commuter, uh, certain commuters in China, perhaps they don't mind having a shorter range vehicle. Um, there is probably some breakthrough that Tesla has had where they can actually get more energy density from an LFP battery than what we've seen in the past, because that is, without a doubt, an older technology. Um, very small company I'd been tracking for a few years, and um, you know it, it was kind of a dog. It was an underperformer, but they had a lot of patents related to supercapacitor um, technologies. And these are kind of like batteries that would provide an ultra jolt of energy. And it sort of wouldn't last for very long, but it's the type of jolt that you would need, let's say, to go from a stop to a very fast start. So it's possible that Tesla combined some of the supercapacity um, supercapacitor technology with the existing LFPs and maybe was able to squeeze out a little more energy density. So why else would they switch to this battery format? A lot of people are writing about the fact that, well, you know, perhaps this is bearish for metals. Maybe the industry is switching away from NMC. I think that's the wrong read. I think Tesla has said time and again that they want, they should really call these batteries instead of lithium ion, they should call them nickel batteries because they want to approach 97% nickel by weight. And that's really not changing. The rest of the industry has congregated around the NMC format. And if you talk to engineers at these OEMs, or if you talk to professors, uh, chemistry professors in this field, they will tell you that, look, we are you know, more than a decade away from any other type of competing technology that would unseat NMC. Further, even if there was some new technology they haven't even thought of yet, it's generally over a decade of testing at the OEMs to have a new technology become commercially viable. So I don't think this is a harbinger of switching away from nickel heavy batteries. Rather, I think this is evidence of Tesla's behavior that they want to minimize as much cobalt as possible. You also have a Tesla agreeing with Glencore to, you know, an offtake agreement, which would supply Glencore, or Glencore would supply Tesla with some base level amount of cobalt for the next decade. The bottom line here is, though, that Tesla sees the writing on the wall. A, there's not enough cobalt to go around. And B, they need to be sure that the cobalt they do have isn't coming from such an ethically undefensible source. If you're measuring it just based on upfront costs and then, you know, cost per mile driven, well, then you have to decide, all right, well, how long am I keeping this vehicle? Um, but also, what are the ongoing maintenance costs? Because if you have the presumption that with less moving parts, your ongoing maintenance for an EV is going to be lower, you could say that you're already below that um, in terms totally. of EVs being cheaper than ICEs. Yep. Um, another factor is if you go to China, uh, their traditional ICEs are so much more cheap versus you know Western OEMs that the parity decision is going to have to take a little bit longer. But in China, that's kind of like, all right, well, they're going from a carrot approach in terms of subsidies for electric vehicles, and they reduced those subsidies in June of last year. They're moving now more towards a stick, which is demanding that, you know, if you want a license or a permit to drive within Beijing, for example, you have to apply in a lottery, and your odds of being able to drive an ICE are very, very low. So, again, when you're a centrally planned government, you can sort of not worry quite as much about that, that efficiency um, threshold point. It, the Got cost it. to produce is going to be quite a bit higher for EVs for a while. And, and you know, uh, most auto Williams know, like, look, this is going to be a loss leader for us, and we have to make a huge upfront investment to get it back. But we're just thinking about it in terms of consumer adoption. And when I think about what is it that, you know, triggers the S-curve technology adoption, it's really going to be that, that point of parity, along with, you know, consideration of how many charging stations you have in a particular area. Right. But I'm talking about to the consumer, depending on how you measure it, you know, Bloomberg New Energy Finance uh, had a special last week on Bloomberg TV where they said it might be 2024. I think Tesla probably getting there in 2023, but we're a couple years away. The other part of the equation here, and this is why Elon Musk has been trying to drive EV adoption, it's really about creating a second secondary market for EV batteries. And the more you have EVs decline in the cost, uh, the easier it is for those batteries to then, you know, after an EV has sort of extinguished its usable life, to hook that up to the grid or to your home. That's really the holy grail for Elon to say, look, I don't care quite as much about EVs, but I, if I want to really fight climate change, 
I need wind power that's available all the time, but if I'm hooked up to a battery, that's how you get there. Within five years of a robotaxi, you know, trying to get to that one million mile limit, the efficiency of the battery, that's one thing that Elon Musk can't really change, the fact that it's going to degrade over time. So maybe five years in, instead of saying, okay, it's 300 miles on a charge, you might dip down to 200 miles. So as that kind of escapes, yes, you can say, well, if this is for urban use, I'm fine using it for 200 miles. And if it's autonomous and it can go charge at some midpoint in the day, maybe it doesn't have to go 24 hours or 12 hours before you charge it again. So it's really, you know, what is the use of the vehicle? Sure, you could drive it for a million miles. It's just you have to recognize that maybe after 10 years and a million miles, you charge it up and you're only getting a third of what you initially would have expected from the battery. So if you're in an urban environment, that's great. Uh, I think more likely you'll start to see consumers say, all right, once you get down to 50, 60, probably 70% of the initial power, that's when you swap out the battery. Maybe I take the old battery, attach it to my home because I don't care if it's 70% or 50%, it's all gravy to me. Right. And then I get a new battery in there. That's really the, the end game. It's a combination of a lot of those things. It's consumer preference, it's cost, it's time. Uh, they have had a head start uh, in you know integrating their battery technology and you know reducing costs by you know creating their gigafactory before a lot of other OEMs are thinking that way. Um, I don't think it's anything innate, other than maybe as I said at the beginning that they think about this more like Apple does, which is you know software and hardware cohesively together. Uh, as Elon has said. You know, one of the reasons that, you know, he thinks everybody should be getting a Tesla is, you know, five years from now, to the extent autonomy is all the rage, it's just a software update for your Tesla. Yeah. There's no new hardware that you have to buy. So I think it's really the philosophy of thinking about the hardware and software aspects of the technology going hand in hand, as well as planning out the supply chain. And there have been plenty of hiccups along the way, but planning out the supply chain in such a cohesive manner has given them an advantage. They just think about this in a way that, you know, is more akin to a technology company versus a traditional OEM. So I don't think there's anything, I, I think you're starting to see that change and you're seeing, you know, whether it's through OEMs partnering with tech companies to get there, um, they certainly have the capital and they certainly have the market's blessing to do so because, um, you know, there's a reason that VW is coming out and saying we're going to have, you know, 80 different EV models on the road in a decade. Like everybody wants to be ahead of this curve because everybody can see where this is headed. Um, so with unlimited capital and a lot of brilliant engineers, I'm sure other people will catch up. Um, the one hesitation, frankly, I would have about Tesla is that, as we said, this is really just stage one in Elon's plan to save the world. Um, and I use that, you know, jokingly with a little hyperbole, but really to him, he doesn't want to die just with the mantle of, you know, greatest electric vehicle producer. He really does want to die on Mars. Like if yeah, he's really he, old. He wants to go and live the rest of his days as part of a permanent Martian colony. Oh, Elon, I got to talk to you about this. He wants to use this as a stepping stone to get battery costs down for the purpose of driving renewable adoption. So... At what point does he pivot away towards that goal or towards SpaceX uh, more fully and sort of leave Tesla to its own devices? Um, I think they'll still be fine, of course. Um, but I don't think there's, you know, certainly unlimited capital will eventually cause that gap to narrow. But right now it is a pretty sizable gap.